make you members okay um let's move back to the topic now we kind of finished chapter two here i think maybe chapter one it was yeah maybe it was chapter one and of course the next uh, point would be chapter two so let's move to chapter two and discuss uh, that one a little bit still we are not kind of yet into the heart of the course it starts basically in chapter three and we start discussing penalty kicks and then we kind of move into more hardcore stuff so for the moment we are kind of just introducing of course this part of these uh, measurements for for uh, league uh, competitiveness is important okay it's uh, it's something i can kind of test you on yeah the title of chapter 2 is soccer's need for game theory or football's need for game theory and um, Again, we return to this character, uh, Egil Olsen. As I told you, he, he used to be the Norwegian national team coach. Uh, and there's actually two periods in time. He was that for the Norwegian national football team. There was uh, an early period starting in, uh, yeah, I would guess 91, 92 or something, ending up in 98. And then he came back just two years ago or something maybe three years ago, and then had a period of two years or something. Uh, uh, so <coughs> let's have a little look on what he did, okay? Let's talk a little bit about Drillo or Egil Olsen, what kind of concepts he introduced into Norwegian football. As I said, he wrote the master, master thesis in 1974, uh, and he did some empirical analysis, okay? So he kind of observed football <laughs> matches, and what he was interested in those days was to count passes before goals. Okay? That means that you have to, when you start watching a football match, you have to count every pass. And then if there is a goal, you have the number of passes before that goal. Okay? Of course, it's kind of tedious work, isn't it? In those days, they didn't have TV. Of course, today you can use TV for these kind of tasks, so it's relatively much easier today. You can maybe even construct some software that does this automatically for you. Okay, you see on these matches, they count the number of passes, don't they? You see the number of passes, and of course, if as long as you count the goals, you can do this automatically today. But in those days, in 1974, you didn't have this technology. Uh, you didn't even have TV coverage of football matches, so they were not actually taped. So, what do you think Egil Olsen had to do then? Of course, he had to travel around, watching a lot of football matches with his papers, Counting passes, oh, there is a goal. I have five passes before this goal. And then keeping on, another goal, oh, only three passes. Okay, so this was kind of how he did this back in 74. And he ended up with this table here. Okay. Number of passes in percent by the scoring team before a goal. So there were 7.9% of the goals that didn't have any passes. What would that mean? What kind of goals do we talk about then? Penalty kicks, free, sh free kicks, and in very rare cases, goals by the keeper. Okay? Yeah, from starting point, okay? That is very rare, isn't it? Have you ever seen that happen? A goalkeeper scoring from a five meter kick? I assume it has happened, but it's very seldom. And then there was 36.5% of the goals, which had only a single pass. That could also be free kicks, of course, but it could be starting from the keeper and then ending at one person, for instance, heading to another person, making the goal. That is kind of the typical situation for these one-pass goals. And then 12.7% of the goals only needed two passes, and then you see that the number of passes underlying the rest of the goals are kind of diminishing very fast here. So there's only 3.2% of the goals that kind of had nine passes before the goal. A kind of Barcelona goal, okay? Most Barcelona goals today, they have maybe 9, 10, 11, 15, up to 20 passes before a goal. Uh, another way of looking at this information is to aggregate the table, just adding together <coughs> Let's say we add together all these numbers up to and including, including three and add these three together. Then we can kind of comp compress this table into this table. 
uh, which tells us that 57.1% uh, of the goals came after a number of passes less than or equal to 2, while 42.9% of the goals came after a pass number from 3 and upwards. Okay, so this kind of tells, t told Egil Olsen in those days that uh, it must be much more efficient to go for a minimal amount of passes in order to get a maximal amount of goals. Okay, that was his kind of uh, inference or deduction or conclusion based on his research. And as opposed to most normal researchers, Egil Olsen was given the opportunity to test this in reality. Okay, to take this system and put it in real use and see what happened. So, of course, he had to do a little bit more than this. Okay, he had to kind of put it into the real setting and try to construct a way of playing football where you avoid to use the pass. So it kind of ended up with a system which kind of could be described uh, maybe a little bit easy as follows. Okay, if you have the ball, then you just throw it up, okay, and hope for one of your own forwards to get it and maybe pass it to another one to get a goal. Okay. But this was not the main strategy to get goal. The other part of the system was uh, related, and I'm just only talking about attacking. Okay, the other part of the system was related to trying to get the ball from the opponent, and preferably as close to the opponent's goal as possible. Okay, so you're kind of you need an opponent who does not push long long balls. Okay, to make this system work. But fortunately, in those days, and maybe even today, most uh, very good opponents, they, they prefer not to, to throw long balls, so they kind of like to pass, starting from the keeper, going to, the, to one of the defenders, and then kind of slowly moving upwards by passing the ball to each other. And the idea from Olsen was to try to put in a very strong defense in this phase to win the ball, and then one or two passes to get the goal. Okay, that was his system. Here you can see an example of two types of different goals. There is a Norwegian goal made in 1998 by Tor André Flo, which kind of tops up here after a free kick and a flicker, and then the final goal. Okay, this is kind of the typical way. Norway made their goals in those days, but they also made a lot of goals like this. And there you kind of con can compare to a goal by Milan in against Sampdoria in '92 by a uh, long forgotten Italian football player called Albertini. I don't know whether you ever heard that name, but uh, he used to be uh, a good uh, player on Milan. Uh, now, this is uh, more than 20 years ago, isn't it? Yeah. And you see these kind of narrow passing around, and then you kind of, of course, you can uh, you can analyze a lot of uh, Barcelona goals, for instance, today, and you see they kind of resemble these even in more than these. So you get, if you take a Barcelona goal, you will get uh, back and forth a few times, back and, and then and then a long a long time, and then suddenly there is a goal. Okay, it may be 20, even 30, maybe sometimes 40 or 50 passes before a Barcelona goal. So what has happened since those days is, of course, that you there are still kind of teams that kind of play more like Norway did in those days, uh, preferably not very good teams, because the best teams, they, they adopt a lot of more passing. The reason is, of course, that the best teams, they are better, so they can kind of risk, take this risk, and if they are very good in passing, they, they don't re even take a big risk, like Barcelona also. So, uh, so it, uh, and of course, if the audience likes this kind of play, then it's an optimal choice, so to speak. Uh, So, uh, in one sense, you can say that Egil Olsen wasn't really interested in attack as such. Okay, he didn't want to build up attacks. He wanted to break the opponent and then attack fast. So his way of attacking was to use the defense. Okay, in a sense, much like handball. Okay, the Norwegian female handball team has been very successful, and one of their, their main strategies, and also a lot of other successful female handball teams is this, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, I don't know the English word, but you know when you, 
you win the ball on a very fast attack. You just throw it to some front player and then you get the goal. Okay. So it's like a kind of a handball strategy in football. Okay. You avoid all these passing and then you just uh, spend your resources on trying to win the ball in a favorable position. And then it means in the sense that the attack is the best defense here, uh, which kind of is the, the old fashioned way is kind of turned around into defense is the best attack. If you listen to Norwegian handball coaches, they, they tend to say this a lot, don't they? That we have to get our defense working in order to attack good. Okay, of course, a lot more, more and more football coaches start to say that as well, of course. Because if you don't have your defense ready, it's not, not much point in attacking. Because if you, your defense doesn't work, you will always have a lot of goal against anyway. But uh, you can see his own words here. He says here, if the opponent is balanced, meaning that they can have a lot of people structured along the field, then, then we use the long pass. Okay, so then you just throw the ball away, basically. So in, in the extreme here, you could might as well just, given that you have the ball, just give it to the opponent. Let him play, and then you try to attack it. If the opponent is unbalanced, a breakdown has emerged, attack fast and with few passes. Okay, that was kind of the, the underlying of his offensive ideas. Of course, there was a lot more ideas related to the defensive play. A zonal defense and this kind of stuff. Okay, but uh, but we that that's something we will not discuss in details here. Okay, let's have a look at the effects of this strategy historically. Okay, here you have um, let's see if we can make this nice. Yeah, we could. Here is a list of Norwegian coaches over time where we have registered the point score they achieved during their careers on average, these red lines and these blue lines actual point score. Okay? And uh, the, the matches we which are picked here are only, should we say, interesting matches. So all private matches are not here, only qualification matches for European and World Championships matches are registered here. Okay. And you see all these coaches, George Curtis back in the 70s, Nils Arne Agen, Selske van Andreasen in 1975, and then it, was, it should be not Foss, but Fossen, Torus de Fossen, he was a coach for a long period as you can see, from the late 70s until the mid 80s. And then there was a Swede called Grip, who was a very short period. And uh, there was Ingvar Stadheim, who came kind of uh, in the early 90s. And then Drillor Egil Olsen, who had this period up from uh, yeah, 92, 91 up to 98. And then uh, Nils Jan Sem, Sem kind of came for a, a relatively shorter period. And then there is something happening after here, isn't it? Who was kind of taking over after Sem, do you remember that? Christian, you know this? I have a feeling. Yeah, do you think it was Olga Harede? I think that as well. And then he quit it, and then who came in after him? That was Dillo perhaps again? And then Högmo? Yeah, I don't remember. I think, I think more or less that's correct. This is not important. The point here is to look at the differences here, okay? You see, of course, that Egil Wilson had a tremendous, much better record than any other one. You also can see that Nils Jom Sem has the second best. And of course, you should never have a Swedish coach in Norway. You see this line here for this grip was not very nice. Okay, has 0 0.3 points. Okay, that's not much. But you see Drillo, he kind of achieved around 2.35 as an average. That's, that's kind of good, isn't it? If you get three points, of course, you win all matches two points, meaning that you will win home matches and draw away matches. That's a good strategy, okay? So normally two points per match holds for anything you like, okay? But Drillo was even better. He was uh, up around 2.35. That's uh, very much. What is more that at the moment? They have 68, don't they? They have played 28. What is this fraction? Can you calculate it for me? Do you have an iPhone or something, Simon? Hmm? 243. Okay, that's better than Drillo then. then. It's very good, but of course, it's not yet finished. Okay, so if they lose the two next matches, then they end up with 68 
over 30. How much is that then? Uh, that's my guess. Okay. 227. 227. Okay, so you see it's uh, it will be in these areas. Okay. Point score per match is something which is nice to register, easy to calculate, and uh, a good indicator on performance. Of course, these had impacts on the uh, FIFA ranking. Okay, if you look at the FIFA ranking here, you can see see the the resemblance here. Um, you see, Egil Olsen, he was actually done uh, in two periods. Here, it was very good. Okay, here we are at number two, I think, and here we also, or maybe, are number three. Okay, and see, in this period here, it was an average around five or six. Okay, so for a fairly long time period, up. To the that would be around 96, 97, perhaps 95. The average uh, FIFA rank on Norway was circling around five, six, four, seven. Okay, so it, it was really good. Okay, uh, uh, something never to be seen before in Norwegian football history. Of course, in the later parts of Olsen's regime, you see something negative happen. Of course, on the FIFA rank, it's nice to be far down here okay it's not nice to be up here so something is happening here okay it's kind of two distinctly different averages here of course what happened here was was, was th in the first case that Norway managed to qualify for the United States World Championships which took place in 94 around here okay and you you might assume here that some of the competitors on Norway kind of observed this and maybe did something about it okay and that that's kind of the game theory way of thinking here isn't it Egi Lusen, he kind of observes reality okay and he say okay it turns out that historically it seems like a nice strategy to use few passes then he implements that into a style okay we, we try to build the style based on this fact the problem with this kind of strategy is that it kind of assumes that the guys you play against do not react on this. Okay. And for some time period here, it seems that it, it was actually successful. Okay. In this period here, it doesn't seem to have been much of a reaction. Okay. Because Norway kind of grew steadily on the FIFA rank and was constantly beating all these good teams. Brazil, Netherlands, England, whatever. Okay. Whatever you threw at Norway in those days, they won. But we may suspect that uh, as times moved on, of course, the competitors observed that Norway was kind of getting much better and we had to do something to avoid losing against them. And that's perhaps what happened. So the point here, here is if you really want to build a strategy in football that has certain qualities, it's a very dangerous path to, do path to do this. Of course, Norway didn't have much to lose here. You started out in this period here, being number 30 or 40 on the FIFA rank. So it didn't really matter. Okay? So you might as well do this experiment. And it turned out to be very nice. And of course, everybody was happy. And this coach, he was kind of considered to be a genius. Uh, from a tactical, strategic game theory point, this is not a genius kind of action, is it? Um, you should. Uh, you should perhaps have a much more complex strategic structure in order to be able to react to the reactions that come back to you. Uh, so the point here in this chapter is, is to try to kind of tell you that these kind of strategies, they kind of must die. Okay? They, they cannot survive in the long run. The reason why these strategies survived so long as it did is perhaps that all these other teams are very snobbish. Okay? And by snobbish I mean they didn't really want to put in the necessary countermeasures. Because countermeasures against this strategy is very easy, isn't it? An obvious countermeasures, uh, countermeasure against this type of strategy would be to, be, 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 would be to do exactly the same as Norway. If Norway are playing Brazil and Brazil adopts Norwegian strategy, then nothing will happen, will it? Or in general, I would expect Brazil to win. Because if they start throwing long balls instead of playing through mid midfield, exposing to Norwegian attacks, then they are in general better players. 
So they are perhaps better to catch the ball, the long ball, better to put it down and better to put it in the goal. Okay? So in general, that would be a very good strategy for Brazil or the Netherlands or whoever. Okay? Maybe even Belgium. Yenka, they used to have a good team, didn't they? In, yeah, and they have a good team now. But there's been 10 or 15 years with a very bad Belgium team, haven't it? You don't know, do you? Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, you know. What's the reason for that? What happened in Belgium? You don't know. At least you can observe it from the FIFA rank. You can, you can see the same development there, but of course they are very good now. They, they did a good world championship. At least not very bad. Okay. They, I don't know how far they, they got. Were they the quarterfinals? Yeah. yeah. That's impressive, isn't it? A small country. How many people are there living in Belgium? 10 million. 10 million. 11 million. Okay. That's not a small country. At least not compared to Norway. Okay. So here is the Norwegian headline. Uh, the goalkeeper at that time, Frode Grudhos, is of course still active in the business, as you probably know. He's a keeper trainer on the national team, isn't he? Yeah. And he, he expresses uh, uh, something back in '98 in the World Championships in France, then. As you probably know, this is the only time no Norway ever has performed in a World Championship tournament, progressing to the eighth finals, losing against Italy, by the way, after beating Brazil in the group stage in the last match. A match I, did I actually saw, which was a very nice thing, of course, to be there at that point. I didn't see the eighth final. But uh, this was a game before that. They were playing in a group against Morocco and uh, Ireland, perhaps? No. I don't remember. Brazil, Morocco, and the third team. Mm. You, do you remember this? No. You, you weren't born in those days, were you? And were they born uh, before 98 here? Yeah. When were you born then? 99? 97? 6? 89. 89. Ah, you're a routine guy, Christian. <laughs> 89, 99. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this at least you were not very big in those days. Yeah. So he, he, is, he says here, Morocco played like us. And I remember this match because up to that point, uh, Norway very seldom had met opponents who kind of adopted Norwegian strategy to kind of pushing a lot of long balls. But uh, it turned out that Morocco did that in that match. And of course, Maro Morocco was not known for applying that strategy ever. Nobody had ever seen Morocco play like that. Morocco is kind of a classical African team, playing a lot of short passes, moving very slowly. But they had maybe seen some of the matches Norway played against African teams in those days, and Norway tend to win with a lot of goals. So they, they, they probably understood that to be able to, to, to handle the Norwegian strategy, we'll have to do something. And they actually did implement a relatively similar strategy as Norway, and the they match ended with a draw, I think. I think it ended 2-2. Could it be Scotland? That was the third, uh, the last team in the group. Yeah, yeah. So <coughs> you see, simple knowledge of game theory thinking may kill these kind of strategies. So it's kind of just luck that it kind of lasted as long as it did, due to the fact that the teams we played, they didn't kind of take Norway seriously enough. Okay, so they didn't want to do what they really knew was necessary to to uh, to um, to stop the Norwegian success. Now go after this time period, if you look back here, and of course in general what you could say is that Nils Jansen he kind of continued the Olsen strategy, so the national Norwegian national team played more or less the same. And uh, there's, there's in those days there were, were a lot of debate. What has happened? Okay, you, you came here, you changed the coach. He kind of played the same way. As you see here, it was a kind of nice start, but then a complete disaster. Okay, up into the 30s, in the end of the same period. And of course, there was a lot of discussion about could it be the change in the coach that made this was Sam so much a worse coach. Or, but surprisingly enough, very little focus was put on the fact that we try to discuss here, okay, related to the fact that suddenly 
the opponents started to change. They, they played differently against Norway. And it made it much tougher for Norway to get uh, the points they used to get. Of course, afterwards, this way of playing, as you probably remember, Egil Olsen didn't play as a coach in, in such an extreme way in the second period as he did in the first period. So probably he also learned something here about uh, the kind of lack of robustness of his strategy when it comes to... So he kind of introduced much more. Perhaps not much more, but at least uh, some more passing in the team. But the point here is, in a sense, very simple. Okay, we if you want to analyze a game like football or can any kind of team game for that sake, and you want to build a strategy, then you must be very careful with using kind of statistical means to find what did what did work in the past and put that into the future, because in the past this kind of strategy wasn't played, and the reactions to that strategy is not visible through the observations you make. So when you do something in a different way, of course, you should also expect that the opponents would react to that. And that's the way game theory works. Okay. So Egil Olsen did, in a sense, not introduce a Nash equilibrium strategy. Okay. He kind of introduced a partial strategy. And it turned out to be successful, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it was a good strategy. Okay. Of course, historically, it was good in the sense that Norway performed. But in the long run, it didn't seem to work, because now we are even worse than any time, isn't we? Now we're, we are not into the 35s or 40s, we're back in the 60s and 70s now on the FIFA rank, I think. So we're kind of back into where we were in this time period, unfortunately. So in the long run, of course, what you need is still good football players. In the short run, you can try to compensate by using clever strategies, but you must assume, as we do in game theory, that your opponents are not fools. Okay, so in the long run, at least, they are never fools. In the short run, they may be fools, they may be snobbish, playing their nice passing and losing for Norway, which they did in a certain period, but in the long run, they never will do that. Because football is so important that that's a very silly strategy. And we can't assume that our opponents are silly, can we? In that case, in the long run, we will lose. So that's the kind of learning here, okay? Game theory is to some extent necessary in order to build and, and analyze and judge how to play football. Unfortunately, not many coaches have any training in game theory. Of course, it doesn't mean that they don't understand it, but uh, that's the system. In the, in the future, I assume this will change, okay? Okay, that was kind of the main concept contents of chapter 2. Now let's move uh, into... Yeah, Grudos was kind of surprised here. He said that... Uh, he, he, he says uh, he, he, he meant Morocco uh, surprised something. They played like us, he says, to Netavisen in those days. Okay. Yeah. You can see here, if you do a little analysis on this previous figure, putting some regression lines. Maybe you, do you know what a regression line is? No, I assume you don't. Now, if you if you have some observations, okay, suppose you observe something, something that should be related to each other. Suppose you have the interest rate here, and you have the number of flats sold in Molde, okay? You would expect that if you have a very low interest rate, more people buy houses, okay? Because there is a certain capital cost related to it. So you should kind of expect uh, maybe the other way around, shouldn't it be? A high interest rate would be little sales. So it should be something like this, okay? Some kind of... But you, you, can, uh, you can kind of expect these observations to fall on any kind of curve. So what you often do then is to just to to put a certain straight line into such data to kind of get an indication on whether there is some kind of connection. That's basically what we have done here, okay? Th you need some mathematical techniques to do this, and I don't intend to spend time on telling you about that. You may get to know that in other courses. 
but yeah, you cannot just put lines here. It kind of, in a sense, fits best to the observations on the blue line. Can you see that both these lines they are not very difficult, different, are they? Throughout the period of Egg-Lulsen, you see a constantly decreasing effect. Okay, this is the FIFA rank. You start at four and you end up at fifteen. Here you start up at the same, but you of course the period is uh, yeah. There's a little bit more steep decrease here. So, so the, the point is perhaps that. It's not necessarily such that either of these coaches are better than the other. Okay, it's, uh, it could be the opponent's reaction, which kind of are more strong in the latter case than in the first case, and that could explain just as well explain what happened as a potential quality difference between the coaches. So, so this is kind of the, the main point here. Okay, do we have any questions? No, this was clear as glass. That's good. Now we'll move back into more specific game theory and we will look into chapter 3 which is named Game Theory and Coaching and we will start with the penalty kick. Okay. So let me move into my notes here and see how I normally do this. Now, my intention is to stop after this hour today because I have something I have to do and we have uh, more or less enough time. But we will continue out this hour. So, let's talk a little bit about penalty kicks. Uh, you know how it works. There are in that game more or less two obvious players. What we won, uh, the guy who takes the penalty kick, or the girl for that matter, which we may refer to as the executor the guy who executes the penalty kick and then we have the goalkeeper which tries to save it and the ball is put uh, at still at 11 meters and uh, in the old days the rules were that the keeper was not allowed to move before the shoot shot took place okay that was the old rule regime and given the old rule regime this penalty kick was kind of obvious a simultaneous game do you agree? Because as long as the keeper can't move, of course, the, the shooter will have to kind of cannot observe what the keeper does. The keeper can, of course, observe what the shooter does, but he kind of have to, in a sense, make up his mind on what to do before his, uh, the shot is made. Because if he, and then he have to make his move exactly at the same time as the ball is, is shot. But then they made a change in the rules. I don't remember when, it was uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, I think. And they, due to the fact that most keepers disobeyed this rule, they tried to move a little bit before the shot came. And of course, in the old days, then you would, you would actually blow the whistle and retake the penalty kick. But it turned out that uh, the, the referee's ability to observe this action was so lousy that they decided to change the rules instead, allowing the keeper to move. He is not allowed to move, as far as I understand the rules today, he is not al allowed to move outside the line, but he can move alongside the line, before the shot is made. Okay. One leg outside the line, but not the goal. Okay, one leg outside the line. Christian, you are an expert here. Yeah, very good. Uh, we just listened to Christian, he knows this. Okay. So, uh, then, of course, these games changed, doesn't it? Because it opens up for the possibility for the executor to make an observation. So he can kind of run through the ball, then stop and hope that the keeper moves and then put it in the open goal. Okay? It's not allowed anymore. It's not allowed anymore. To stop in the middle of the penalty. But you can slow down your speed. Yeah, you can. Yeah. But you're not so you can start running very fast and then you slow. But you can try to make a movement before you shoot, try to kind of make the keeper move and then put it. That's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So this ability to make this game sequential kind of opens up with the new rules. Okay, that's an important point. Uh, but my point 
and I think most guys who do research in penalty kicks point is that if it really matters if this is a very important match then there are almost no executors who dares this kind of strategy because the pressure is so big here and if it's this is kind of advancing in a big tournament the money is so big the difference between the final and the semi-finals in the world championships could be millions of tens or hundreds of millions for each player on the team so uh, it's an enormous amount of pressure of course and in those given those considerations it doesn't seem unreasonable to assume that a kind of sequential game here you kind of have to make up your mind and what to do and you do that for both the keeper as well as the shooter seems like a reasonable way still of modeling these type of situations as far as I know, there has not been made any models yet of penalty kicks where you kind of mix sequential and uh, simultaneous games. So this is something, if you're interested, you can think about doing. But it, it starts getting very tricky, so it's not an easy task to do. So most guys who look into this, they kind of assume that, okay, we have two players in a game, the keeper and the executor. The executor has his strategies, okay? There's a lot of strategies, isn't it? You can shoot wide to one of the sides, low, middle, high, you can shoot hard, you can shoot soft, you can use a curved ball, there's a lot of options, isn't it? An enormous amount of options actually, more or less an infinite amount of options on how to do this. The keeper has perhaps less options, but still there is a lot. You, he can stand still, he can move to one of the sides, he can try to wait for the shoot to happen and then move. Uh, so again, the complexity is quite big here, okay? Um, in general, you could say that there, there it does perhaps exist a kind of pure strategy Nash equilibrium here. If a player is so good on a penalty that he's able to shoot the ball in the top corner with enough force, with a reasonable probability of hitting, he should always do that. Do you agree? Because then most keepers would not be able to grasp it even though they go in the right so um, if you are so good taking penalties that you're able to place the ball either up here or up here with enough force then you don't need to think about how to do this do you then you might as well do that because then it will be a goal but we seldom see that do we and the reason is of course that the force you need to be certain here is so big that the risk of missing is big because if you aim for this point it's easier to miss than if you aim for this point or this point do you agree yeah i assume you have taken some penalties so you know this okay so that kind of boils down to that uh, that we, we we are looking at uh, a kind of game where we perhaps should expect some mixed strategies as the outcome okay because the idea then is to try to shoot somewhere where the keeper cannot guess where you're shooting and you want to shoot at the point the keeper wants to push himself uh, in a direction which the executor can't guess. So you're kind of trying to avoid this guessing situation and then you're kind of back to the rock, paper, scissors game or the even odd game we look at. This is the same type of game we would expect, but it's, it's kind of slightly, slightly more complex and we have to kind of look at it in more detail. And that's what we intend to do when we start doing this. Even though the penalty kick perhaps is the easiest sub-game we can look at in football, it doesn't mean that it's not important. Okay? As you probably know, penalties have a tendency to, tendency to define or to, to decide many important situations. If you remember the home team this season, they were playing against a team from Ukraine called Luhansk, I think. And... Uh, I don't remember the first leg. Was it the draw? A 1-1? One, one? Yes, I think it was a 1-1. One, one. And uh, at some point, relatively late in that match, Molde got the penalty kick, didn't they? And I think Vega Foren missed that penalty kick. And after that, they lost the match. So they kind of kicked out of the European game by that match. Uh, I don't think they would have qualified. They had to have another match to actually qualify, but the potential loss was very big. Okay, Even at the European League setting today, there is 25, 30, 40 millions to, to earn. So, 
So getting out of it could be, in a sense, very costly for a Norwegian team. So uh, the penalty kicks are decisive, especially in tournaments, of course, where there is the the, the mean of uh, of this of uh, making decisions on even matches. So if there is a draw, you end up with extra time, and then ultimately a penalty kick competition. Now. There is major rule differences between penalty kick competitions and ordinary penalty kick awarded in games. I assume you know this difference. An ordinary penalty kick, it's allowed to a possible rebound can be put into the net to produce a goal. That is not allowed in a penalty kick competition. You only have one try there. And this difference, of course, makes these two penalty kick situ situations very different from a game theoretic point of view. Of course, the penalty kick competition situation is much easier than the ordinary penalty kick. Because the ordinary penalty kick also then involves other players to a much greater detail, doesn't it? How you stand, how you can, what decisions you make immediately after the penalty kick has been made is then important for the outcome. So we kind of stick to this penalty kick competition situation. Because if you move to these ordinary penalty kicks, it becomes much more difficult. And that, of course, means that if you really want to test the models we will look at here, you should be careful by observing real penalty kicks, which kind of are awarded in normal matches, because that is quite a different game, much more complex game. Something which is from time sometimes easy to forget, okay, that uh, the rules are so different that uh, they kind of construct two very different games. And if you observe should we say ordinary penalty kicks, you will see that a fair amount of the goals who are scored on ordinary penalty kicks are made through this rebound system, either by the executor himself or by another player. I don't have these numbers ready, uh, maybe I would uh, guess maybe around 10% of the goals are made by rebounds, and that's a fair amount. So uh, the next time, next week, uh, actually on Monday next week, we will start out doing the exercises, okay? And then if we finish uh, on that day, we will s continue with the penalty kicks here. Uh, uh, if not, we will move on with the penalty kicks on Tuesday. We are kind of a little bit ahead of schedule in the course, so there's kind of good time. So if you want to do something at the next lecture, you can read this chapter 3 here. Okay, you, you need to pay a lot of attention on what's, what's here, on our assumptions, how we kind of construct the game. That's important, okay? Because we kind of lay down our model by making these statements here. This is kind of the, the tough part of doing game theory research, so to speak, how to kind of construct our game in such a manner that we are able to use it to something, that it n neither gets too complex nor too simple. Kind of balance it in a way that we kind of get something out of it, which produces results which may be of interest. Okay, that's enough for today. Thank you. We meet next Monday, starting with the first set of exercises.